Good afternoon and welcome to today's training session uh, where we're going to cover the essentials of the FAAC B680H barrier. As always, um, all attendees are muted uh, during this presentation. So if you do have any questions along the way, feel free to chat them into the um, uh, uh, chat box or otherwise there will be a section at the end where we'll cover questions and answers. So let's kick, let's kick right off um, looking at our, our agenda. We're going to be um, firstly looking at just the main features of the uh, B680, looking a little bit at the mechanical installation. We'll spend quite a bit of time on the E680 uh, control board and the programming thereof. Uh, touch on some of the maintenance and uh, then we'll have time for some questions and answers. So kicking right off, um, the uh, B680 utilizes what we call hybrid technology. This, uh, this technology ensures a high reliability in, in any application. And uh, basically what it does is it combines the advantages of a DC motor, in this case, a brushless DC motor with uh, hydraulic technology. And uh, the, the DC motor allows for a continuous duty cycle, so 100% duty cycle, and that makes the uh, barrier suitable for very high traffic applications. Uh, and the hydraulic uh, technology ensures the unit is very reliable and durable. So the 36 volts um, DC motor plus the hydraulics uh, referred to as the hybrid technology. The uh, unit is maintenance free and offers a precise control over the position of the beam. There's a hydraulic pump unit which houses the uh, 36 volt DC brushless motor. Um, that gives us also flexible acceleration and deceleration with adjustable opening and closing speeds, a long lifetime and obviously no thermal issues uh, because the motor runs in an oil bath. The uh, casing itself, um, the, or the uh, let's call it the mechanical structure of the boom gate is a self-supporting structure with a removable case. And that's quite good because it means that you have this very strong centerpiece which uh, bears the load and then there's an external case which is removable and that acts as a cover. So it can be removed. Uh, there you see the internal uh, mechanism. And uh, that means that if there is any damage to the case, the vehicle drives into it, collides with it, it's very easy to change that casing without having to replace the entire barrier structure. Foundation plate is compatible with the old 620, 640 uh, barriers. So if you are upgrading from one of those barriers, the uh, installation is uh, very trivial. Unit is maintenance free. The uh, spring, which is often a wear component in these barriers, is rated um, for 2 million cycles, which is basically longer than the entire barrier life expectancy. So there's no need to change the springs during the life of the product. There is an encoder uh, which is fitted uh, on the main um, beam motor or output shaft, and that gives us uh, precise control over the uh, actual position of the beam and also allows us uh, very sensitive collision detection. The control board itself is highly flexible and programmable. Uh, it mounts uh, in the upper part of the internal structure of the barrier. So again, it's out of the way of crashes and it's also in a sealed box. So uh, no issues with humidity and uh, there's easy access for installation and maintenance. We can fit an optional battery backup, which is the XPAC 24, and um, that can be connected to the unit to give uh, emergency backup in the event of power failure. In terms of the actual beams themselves, um, the, the, there is a modular system, uh, and that allows us to basically put in any beam from about two and a half meters up to over eight meters. Um, they can be either one piece beams up to five meters, or they can be two piece beams, which are then joined with an invisible joint. Um, once the, the, the joiner is mounted, you can't actually see it. Um, so that, as I say, allows us beams two meters up to eight meters. Anything longer than uh, four meters can be can be achieved combining two pieces of different length. Um, there are also two different types of beams. There are what we call the S beam, which is up to uh, five meters, and then there's the L beam, which is above five meters. The L beam uh, has a, a slightly larger profile than the S beam. We'll take a look at that in a moment. So there, as an example, you can have a four meter base uh, beam with a four meter extension, giving you the eight meters um, beam length. Uh, the B680 can be mounted as a left or right handed. It's the same unit um, that can be mounted left or right handed. And all you simply do is just remove the spring and fits it on the appropriate side. So in the right hand version, as you can see, the spring is on the one side of the unit. And in the left hand version, we just move the spring across to the other side. So uh, very flexible and uh, very easy to work with. Uh, the unit's also fitted with a couple of lighting options. So there, there is the optional integrated light kind of flashing lamp, which sits at the top of the unit. Uh, there's also a LED strip which can be fitted into the beam. Um, and so that basically gives you, uh, you know, signaling of the status of the boom, uh, flashing lights just to create a bit more visibility and uh, can be used in traffic control application as well. 
Those are the technical specifications. The power supply is a wide range, 100 to 240 volts AC. Uh, the motor rotation speed between 1,000 and 6,000 RPM, that gives us the speed control. The, uh, the, the pump runs on the standard uh, FWSE HP fluid, 1.2 liters of that fluid. There's an anti-crushing system, which is uh, given to us by means of the uh, coder, which I mentioned on the shaft, as well as the deceleration. The unit can run between minus 20 and plus 55 uh, degrees Celsius, and the rated operation or operating time at 55 degrees is continuous duty, 100% duty. There is a uh, surface protection on the unit, uh, zinc uh, primer, plus obviously the painting. The beam type is a round beam, uh, either the S or the L type, uh, equipped with uh, lights above and uh, rubber bumper below, the lights being optional, of course. Uh, the unit's protected to IPC, IP56, so that's uh, outdoor rated, uh, quite a heavy unit, 65 kilos for the main body, plus 20 for the cover. And then uh, the opening and closing times, uh, one and a half seconds uh, on a 2.3 meter arm up to six seconds on the 8.3 meter, which is the maximum arm the unit will, uh, will handle. So going through some parts identification uh, from one through 16, uh, the first one, number one at the top is the built-in flashing lamp, which as I mentioned, is an optional extra. The E680 control board mounted at the top of this, the uh, internal structure, an oil fitter cap on the, uh, fitter cap on the top of the pump, a bleeder screw on the right piston, the hydraulic unit, which is the main pump unit, uh, the right piston itself. There's a built-in heat sink on that main oil tank, which keeps that motor cool, giving you that 100% duty. The right feeder tube, which is feeding uh, hydraulic fluid into the right piston. The left feeder tube, similarly to the left piston. Uh, number 10 is the release and lock, which is at the bottom of the pump unit, accessible uh, from outside through a small aperture in the cover. There's the left piston, uh, the left piston bleeder screw, the, the main cover, which is the red item that covers the unit, the encoder, which sits on the uh, directly on the beam shaft or the output shaft, uh, the incoming power where there would typically be a power switch mounted, uh, and then the switch mode power supply, which sits right at the top of the unit. That converts the 240 volts AC to the 36 volts DC, which is required by the control board. Internally now, we take a look at the main support structure, which is a very beefy I-beam structure, really strong. Uh, mechanical stops for both open and closed. Those are rubber stops fitted at the top. We'll talk about those in a moment. There's the rocker arm, which effectively connects to the two pistons, allowing the beam to be actuated. Uh, the drive shaft to which the beam is connected, the mounting plate, which is uh, bolted down onto the ground. The spring guide, which sits inside the spring, uh, protecting the piston the balance spring, which sits on the outside of the spring guide, and then the preload adjustment ring nut that's uh, used to actually tension that uh, drive spring. All right, uh, taking a look at the uh, beams themselves, um, the two different beam types, as I mentioned, the, the S-type beam and the uh, L-type beam. So the S-beam will be available in up uh, between two meters and five meters. Um, that is a lighter profile and utilizes a black spring. And then we have the L-beam, which as you can see is significantly larger. Uh, that's available in five meter to eight meter. And because that's a much heavier profile, uh, that requires the red spring to counterbalance. So installing the foundation plate, uh, two mechanisms basically for installation. Either you're going into existing concrete hard stand, in which case you would uh, bolt the foundation plate directly down using some chemset anchors, or alternatively, you are going to cast uh, a pad. Um, so basically, uh, assuming you are casting the pad, you'll assemble the foundation plate with the J hooks, uh, which will secure into the concrete. You'll lay the, con the, the conduits into your formwork, uh, ensuring they come out obviously in the desired uh, slot. You'll cast that concrete, uh, you'll mount the foundation plate into the concrete, level it, and then obviously wait for the concrete uh, to cure. Uh, once that concrete is cured, uh, you'll then uh, bolt your uh, boom gate down onto that base plate using the four mounting studs and obviously the washers, uh, lock washers and bolts. Very, very straightforward installation, mechanical installation. Um, next step, you'll remove the vent screw, uh, which is located uh, on the top of the pump unit next to the oil cap. That, that, that breather screw must be removed and uh, ideally stored somewhere, maybe in a little Ziploc bag with the unit, just in case you ever need to return that to the factory. You'll close that up to prevent oil leakage during transit. So there's the breather screw highlighted in red. Uh, left hand versus right hand. So we define left and right by uh, looking from inside the property out, the right hand boom gate closes to the right, the, boom, the beam, and the left hand closes to the left. So uh, as you can see, note the position for the springs on the right and the left hand, um, highlighted with the red arrow. So that's all that you change. 
the the spring is always compressed when the when the boom gate is lowered. Um, so you just need to determine: am I right hand? Am I left hand? Obviously, the uh, you just do then the, the spring installation on the correct piston. The pistons on either side, incidentally, are identical within the unit. So looking at the rocker arm now, this is the arm that's actuated by the pistons and then and thereby drives the actual beam up and down. <clears throat> As you can see, the, the end of the piston is held in place by a, a, a bolt with a, a washer and a nut. And um, we start off by setting that rocker arm uh, horizontally. We remove the, uh, the bolts from the pistons on the, on the beam side and uh, remove the piston. We then fit the spring to the appropriate side, and this, the thing is, the spring is very simple. You just insert the white spring guard first, that protects the piston and guides the spring over the piston. You then uh, drop the, the spring over the spring guard and uh, fit the tension adjustment nut ring. And just pay attention to the direction that that nut ring is fitted. As you can see in uh, point one above, there is a cross through one of them. So there's only one way around that that spring goes. So once that's uh, fitted, we now have to determine where do we connect the end of that piston to the rocker beam. And there's, as you can see, a total of six potential mounting holes, starting with number one, which is at the center of the unit, moving up to number six, which is at the end of the unit. So we need to identify the correct fastening hole from the balancing tables. And we'll look at those balancing tables in a moment. Uh, when you've determined the correct fastening hole, you'll reinsert the bolt and tighten the nut, obviously fixing the piston to that uh, appropriate uh, hole. And then on the opposite side of the balance beam, you will fix the second piston to the same number fastening hole and secure it in the position. So if you take a look at the balancing tables, these are found in the installation manual and they're very clearly marked as balancing tables as I've highlighted with that, with that red block. It is important to note that there is a second set of tables inside the unit, which are configuration tables, which look very similar. Do not mix the two up. That's why I'm highlighting here, these, these are the balancing tables. So the balancing tables will uh, have two page, two tables. There's a table two, which is for the S or the shorter profile, which runs up to the five meter uh, arm. And then there is a uh, uh, table three, which is the L profile. So we'll just focus at this stage on the, uh, on the S profile. Uh, and how do we use this, uh, this balancing table? Well, very simply on the left-hand side is a column of um, what accessories are fitted to the beam, either no accessories, lights, et cetera, et cetera. And the, the top row shows the length of the beam arm or sections of length on the beam arm. So let's just say we've got a foot mounted at the end of this beam and it happens to be four meters long. We just extrapolate down across and down and we see that the correct balancing point for this arm, for this uh, S arm, with uh, four meters long with the foot will be hole number six, which is the outermost hole in this particular case. So as you can see, the table is really very easy to, to use. There is a second table, table three, which I'm showing here, which runs, as you can see, along the top five meter up to eight meter. They will be L beams or the heavier beams. Uh, exactly the same principle applies. Just note that some of the blocks on these tables have diagonal lines through them. What that means is you cannot use those options. So for example, if you have a skirt and a foot and lights, you cannot use a boom arm that's 7.5 or 8 meters long. And also if you have a, a boom link that's somewhere between the two values in that top row, just choose the one that's closest, or choose the value that's closest to the length of your arm. All right, so fitting the beam itself, uh, the unit is shipped with a small protective cap over that spline. So just remove the cap, uh, throw it away. You will fit the, um, the boom mounting plate. Again, noting the correct way to fit it uh, from the diagram. You can see figure two shows how not to put it on. Once you've fitted it on, you can uh, fit the washer uh, in place, uh, the, the large washer and spring washer in place with the provided bolt. Do not grease that bolt, uh, otherwise it'll work itself loose. You then fit the uh, plastic insert, which supports the profile of the arm. Fit the arm and uh, the, the shoe, uh, which, which goes in place with uh, six, six bolts. And once that's in place, uh, the last step is to fit the actual uh, aesthetic cover, the white cover um, over that uh, shoe. It just makes it look pretty, but doesn't form any, uh, uh, it doesn't have any function other than uh, cosmetics. Right, so that's the fitting of the uh, of the actual boom arm. And the very last step, once it's done, uh, lower the boom and uh, fit the red LED strip uh, on the top of the boom arm. That's a transparent strip uh, that covers the LED rope lights if they're fitted. Fit the rubber the rubber bumper strip on the underside of the boom arm into the uh, relevant exclusion. Sometimes helps to spray a little bit of water onto those before you push it in to lubricate them. And then once done, just cut those two lengths and fit the red boom end cap in place with the fasteners provided. 
If you're working with a sectional beam, um, this will be a beam that's made up of two parts. There will be a, a joiner, which you see over here, two parts, one and two. Put those together, slide them into the uh, first section or starter section of beam, which is already fitted onto the uh, onto the uh, the barrier. Slide them in. Uh, fit the uh, fasteners hand tight at this point. Don't tighten them. Then fit the second section of beam, uh, fit its fasteners, and then lastly tighten everything up, and you'll have a nice clean join with an invisible connection. For manual operation, there is a manual release that's located at the bottom of the hydraulic pump unit. Uh, that is accessible, obviously, if the door is open, and if the door is closed, it's accessible through a small aperture in the bottom of the door. Uh, the standard release, there will be the plastic triangular release key, but there is an accessory or an option for an actual um, brass key that can be used to, to secure that. How do we operate the manual release? You just simply insert the key into the lock and turn it counterclockwise at turn or two. And once you've done that, you can then, uh, you'll then find you can actually move the beam up or down manually. When you want to restore operation, you obviously just turn the key clockwise until it stops and then remove it. I stress here not to over tighten that uh, release screw. If you over tighten that, you can actually damage the washer and then the, 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 uh, the, re the release starts to malfunction. So it's important uh, for your own knowledge and also to impress on your customer. If I ever do put this into manual release, just basically tighten it hand tight and leave it at that. The end stop adjustments. Now, the end stops are located right at the top of the, uh, the internal structure, and they're designed to provide a hard stop for the, the beam in the raised and the lowered position. So we need to adjust these end stops to make sure that when the boom gate is raised or when the beam is raised and the beam is lowered, it's in the correct places or at the correct angles. So first, manually release the unit, uh, then just basically swing that arm manually to the open and the closed position up against those stops. And I'm pointing to those stops there with the uh, with the red arrows, depending if it's a left or a right hand operation. One will be the raised stop, one will be the lowered stop. You can then adjust those stops that on that on threaded studs. And when you've got the arm stopping vertically and horizontally in the correct places, then just tighten the lock nuts and fix those uh, those end stops into position. They will determine ultimately where that barrier or where that beam stops in the raised and the lowered position. So it's important to get those positions correct. I want to untighten the lock nuts. Um, and that's the mechanical, um, mechanical installation. So mechanical assembly side done, you now want to balance the beam. Um, it is balanced and neutral. So to do that, you, you'll obviously make sure the beam is installed. You'll, you'll uh, make sure the operator is released and swing that arm to the 45 degree position and verify that it remains there, neutral. Mustn't come down, mustn't go up. If the pole tends to rise uh, or to open, then you just reduce that uh, pressure on the preload uh, spring nut a little, turn it anti-clockwise. Uh, if it tends to drop down from 45, then rather tighten that spring, make the spring a bit stiffer. And uh, the adjustments are, are of that, um, uh, of that preload ring are easiest done with the pole or the beam in the upright position because there's no preload on the spring. But basically, you want to just do that. It's an iterative process. Just do that until you've got that arm sitting neutral at 45 degrees, at which point you uh, you know that your beam is correctly balanced. So once that's done, and there's just a diagram of that uh, that uh, adjustment ring, uh, can be turned clockwise or anti-clockwise. Um, you want to then install the cover. So the uh, the red cosmetic cover then fits over the unit, uh, drops over from the top down, gets fastened in place with a couple of fasteners. Um, you can fit the little end plates uh, onto the cover to make everything look nice and neat. Uh, and then once that's done, you will still have access to the uh, control board from the front door of the unit, but uh, you will no longer be able to easily access access the end stops. So just be, bear that in mind before. Get those end stops and the boom balance before you put that cover on. So moving on now to the uh, E680 controller. I'm just going to quickly go through the physical layout of this control board. Um, we have the inputs connector, which is uh, J1. We'll go into detail on all of these in a moment. We have the outputs connector, uh, which is J2. The uh, signaling lamp connector, and we have inputs for our loop detectors or our loop, uh, loop physical loop wires. Uh, there is a, a plug-in for the motor. There is a bus to easy connector in the bottom left of the board for any bus devices, keypads, beams, etc. you might be using. The um, uh, plug-in for the uh, shaft encoder we spoke about, so that's plugged into the board as well. There is a five pin connector for a radio board, if you're gonna be using that. Um, an input for the emergency battery, uh, another plug for your uh, in incoming power from your power supply. A USB port for firmware upgrades, if those are ever required at any stage. Uh, a plug for your integrated traffic lights. Uh, so those are the lights that sit at the top of the unit that I mentioned are an optional extra. 
uh, and then you have uh, J16 is the outputs to switch your beam light. So those are the LED rope lights that sit on the actual beam itself. Uh, we have some programming buttons and we'll go into in greater depth with those when we look at the programming later on. But anyone familiar with the FAAC equipment will know that the programming of the units is done using that uh, two digit display and the three buttons, the F, the plus and the minus. All right, so uh, having a look at the uh, display itself uh, or some of the diagnostic LEDs, the first is the main display itself, which is a two digit LED display, which is used both for programming as well as to indicate the status of the, the, the barrier. Um, there are a number of other LEDs that I'll just quickly go through. Uh, DL1 and DL2 both relate to the bus. So DL1 shows the bus device status. Uh, number two shows the bus status itself. DL3 shows the status of uh, inductive loop one. DL4 then the status of inductive loop two. Um, we have a board failure signal. So that's if the board itself actually goes horribly wrong. That'll be indicated is uh, the encoder status is indicated on DL7 board power supply on DL9. Then uh, the LEDs along the terminal strip. Uh, so 10 shows the status of the open input, 11 the close input, 12 the uh, safety beam input, 13 the stop input, and 14 the emergency input. DL16 shows that we're on battery power. So those are just some of the uh, status LEDs. So we also can see the radio channel one activity and channel two activity on uh, LED 17 and 18. All right, so in essence, this is just a quick overview of the wiring of the unit. Um, you can see there's a couple of normally open connect connections to open and close and some normally closed connections uh, connected to the FSW stop and alarm inputs. Also two inductive loops are shown connected here, as well as some lights uh, on outputs five and six on the top right hand side. All right, so looking in a bit more depth at the inputs on the control board itself, uh, we have uh, the, the, the main terminal strip J1 uh, showing the open input. Now the open is a normally open contact going to uh, terminal three, and that's basically an input which commands the boom gate to open. So in most cases that, well, in all cases, they will open the boom gate. And in some cases, depending on the operating logic, it could close it as well with a subsequent press. But the open is typically looked at as an open input. We have a dedicated close input, also normally open, and that's basically any pulse generator which which will close the barrier when it's uh, when it's uh, joined or linked to to the negative or the common. So that is a dedicated close input. Then we have FSW. Now FSW is uh, is really designed for a closing photo cell, and that's where you want a photo cell across the entrance to prevent the boom gate from lowering onto something in the way. This is a normally closed input. Okay. Um, so it is important to note that um, uh, normally closed, and if that's not used, we do have to link it common. So if there is no closing state to device connected, you must bridge that FSW contact to ground. We then have a stop contact. This is an emergency stop. Uh, again, normally closed. So typically there will be a big mushroom switch. If there's any, any reason that you need to, in an emergency, shut down the automation, you would break that contact uh, between uh, stop and ground, and uh, that would shut the automation down. You would not be able to activate it. Again, if uh, stop safety devices are not connected, you need to bridge that stop terminal uh, to the ground terminal. Emergency contact terminal number seven. This is an emergency input which will always cause the barrier to open. So this is, for example, in the event of fire, um, you know, evacuation, etc. It uh, effectively has a higher priority than any other command. So regardless of whatever other command is on there, the emergency will always uh, open the boom gate. It is also normally closed, as it needs to be for a, it needs to have a failsafe component to it. And again, if no emergency safety devices are connected, you must bridge the EMR uh, input to ground. Uh, lastly, okay, your ground, which is available on eight and nine, that's obviously the negative for your signals as well as the negative for your accessory power. The uh, 24 volts plus 24 available on terminals 10 and 11, that's for your uh, uh, power to your accessory. So 24 volt DC power, and that'll uh, allow uh, or supply up to 800 milliamps, uh, up to 800 milliamps of auxiliary devices. So just be sure that whatever auxiliaries are connected are not exceeding that 800 milliamps uh, maximum um, capability. All right, so just a quick summary uh, for your safety devices. If there are no safety devices fitted, you must have links between five, six, and seven. So in other words, your FSW, your stop, and it says alarm, but it's actually your emergency input. They all need to be linked to ground if there are no safety devices fitted. If you were to connect a closing PE beam um, for uh, to, to FSW, it'll be connected as shown in the diagram. The, the transmitter is simply powered off 24 volts and ground, and then the normally closed contact of that uh, PE beam receiver is linking the ground through to terminal number five, which is the FSW.
All right, let's take a look at connector two now, which are the outputs. Now, this unit has a number of outputs. So outputs one to three are all open collector outputs. That means that they basically switch an electronic negative out and they can uh, control devices uh, 24 volts up to 100 milliamps. So typically, if you're using any of those three outputs, they would be used to drive a relay contact or a relay coil. And then that relay contact could be used to switch any other devices, lights, uh, building automation, status inputs, etc. But those are electronic outputs. They are not relay contacts. Electronic outputs, they switch a negative out when they're active. And the actual function or the uh, when they switch that negative out is set up in your advanced configuration. And we'll look at that later on in the board programming. But just to, once again, to reiterate, uh, they will switch a negative to a 24 volt DC device uh, and they will sync up to 100 milliamps. Output four is a relay output. So this is a true relay output. Uh, it's an actual relay contact. You can also set it to be activated uh, under a whole lot of uh, options, which we'll cover in the advanced configuration. And this relay, uh, you have access to the common and the normally open of that relay, and it can switch again 24 volts up to 800 milliamps. So significantly more than the open collector outputs, and this, in this case, is a dry contact. All right, uh, you can connect an external flashing lamp, uh, which is to uh, J3, um, and that can be used for any sort of warning purpose. Um, again, can be in the uh, the advanced programming. can also be used as a service indicator, which we'll cover later on. Um, you can connect, uh, this will drive directly a 24 volt DC uh, XLED FAAC external flashing lamp. Uh, if you want to, you know, for example, drive a 240 volt lamp, you'll need to use this to drive a relay and then use the relay to drive the 240 volt lamp. This is not controlling the integrated uh, flashing traffic light, by the way. That traffic light or the integrated light that sits at the top of the unit, that's controlled directly from J15, connector 15, and plugs directly into the control board, does not go into this lamp uh, output. If you're using loop detectors, um, the loops will be connected to loop one and loop two. Loop one is set up as an opening loop, a free to exit loop, it will only open the barrier if activated, and loop two is used as a safety slash closing loop uh, if that functionality is required. As regards the loop detectors, the control board does have two built-in loop detectors. Um, our customers tend to sometimes use these onboard loop detectors, sometimes use external detectors. There's nothing wrong with you using external loop detectors. They just obviously wired in through the normal inputs on the control board and not directly to the loop one and loop two. Loop one and loop two are, are, are basically connectors for the physical loop wire that is in the ground. So you would run it out of the ground, you would twist that feeder cable and fit it into loop one or loop two, depending on the functionality that uh, you want. The motor itself connects to J5. Um, there is a wrapper connector for connecting that motor. Uh, what is important to note, and we'll, we'll touch on it in a moment, this motor has three wires, which is quite unusual for a DC motor, but the reason for that is it is in fact a brushless DC motor, which means it's a three-phase DC motor that has three wires. We'll talk about those wires in a little bit more detail later on, um, but note that there are in fact three, not two, as you would expect with a DC motor. Your next uh, connector is for your uh, shaft encoder, and that plugs into J7, and that's the, the absolute encoder that sits on the actual um, output shaft of the unit and measures the, the angle of the beam. So the unit knows exactly where that beam is at any, at any given point, uh, and that gives us the obviously the, the really accurate control of the beam position as well as collision, uh, collision detection. Radio receiver, the radio receiver, a five pin radio receiver can plug directly into the board. Um, if you're using a two channel receiver, you can uh, you can use your remote controls to command open and close on the unit. If you're using a single channel receiver, it'll only be able to command the open uh, command. Just note, if you are plugging radio receivers in and out or any other devices in and out for that matter, you should always have the electrical power cut off the board. If you're using an emergency battery, it plugs into jumper 12. Um, it's uh, it's the standard XBAT 24 that we use on a number of our other products, but there is a interface uh, cable that's required that is uh, ordered as an accessory when ordering the battery backup. Uh, this is designed as a battery backup and is there again, as I mentioned, if there is a power failure, it will continue to operate the boom for a period of time. Uh, it's not the, the, the boom gas not designed to designed to work off that battery permanently. The battery is in fact 24 volts, whereas the boom gate itself runs off a 36 volt power supply. All right, the power supply itself plugs into J13. Um, what is important to note is that's already pre-wired, but uh, terminal number one, which is the earth terminal, must be connected to the system earth uh, by the installer during the electrical connection operation. So just please take note that there is a requirement to make that earth connection. 
Flashing traffic lights, uh, if fitted, these are the traffic lights that fit again optionally at the top of the boom gate. Uh, they plug into Jumbo J15, um, and that can be used to basically signal barrier movement or give a red or a green light, depending on how you set it up in the advanced settings. And lastly, uh, J16 is the outputs to the rope lights or the LED strips that go inside the boom arm. There are two outputs there, one controls uh, the red and one controls the green. And again, that can be set up to be changed, you know, to turn green, for example, when the boom gate is fully raised, etc. We set that in the advanced program, which we'll touch on a little bit later. Uh, all right, so programming itself is done through the, uh, the two digit display and the three push buttons, the F, the plus, and the minus. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail of the F plus and the minus because if you work with FWC equipment, you'll be familiar with that. But just to touch on it, the F button uh, basically puts us into programming mode and selects the function we wish to program. Uh, and the uh, plus and the minus buttons allow us to change those program values um, to the desired settings. The E680 actually features three programming levels. So you, you'll, be, you'll be familiar with basic programming, which is on all operates. You'll also be familiar with advanced programming, which is typically the second level programming. But the E680 actually allows you to uh, do a uh, third level, which is an expert level. And the expert level um, requires an understanding of what's going on behind the scenes. We will touch on it briefly towards the end of the presentation. All right, um, let's move along now and look at our basic configuration. So the first time we press the F button in basic configuration, we will see CF shown on the display, which is the configuration of the barrier. And the configuration options run between 0, 01 and 0, 06. The 0, 01 is for the minimum mass, in other words, the shortest beam, and uh, 0, 06 is for the longest beam. So it's important before you start operation that you set the correct value for this configuration, because if you set for example, a, a zero one configuration for an eight meter barrier, the barrier is going to run or the beam is going to run at very high speed and that can cause damage to the unit. So you want to be sure you do select the correct configuration. And those configurations are determined from some tables. And I'll show you those tables. And these are the tables that I referred to earlier as being very similar to the beam balancing table. So not to get the two mixed up. The default value for configuration is 06, which is maximum mass, which means that the default of the unit is for the longest possible boom arm, and that's done purposely to ensure that the barrier is running at minimum speed, just in case uh, it, it has the, the, the longest arm uh, fitted. So if we have a look at the default selection tables, this table looks very similar to the uh, beam balancing table, which I showed you earlier. The difference here is it's clearly marked default selection tables. And once again, it refers to both the S and the L profile. So the way we use the table, uh, and I've got the table shown here for the S or the shorter profile. Let's just say we're working with a four meter uh, beam. And on the left hand column, we've only got lights fitted. So there's a light rope. We just extrapolate across and the configure or the default setting for this configuration is two. So we would set two on the uh, configuration and then we would proceed. And that will automatically set up the speeds and the powers correct for a four meter arm with lights fitted. As that all for you don't have to worry about it. So your next option is uh, DF, which is the default. So this basically indicates is this control board in the default uh, default state? If you see a Y indicated for default, it means yes, all the settings are default settings. If you see a no, it means that some settings have been changed. If you want to reset the board to its default, just change that no to a Y to a yes, and that will automatically default the board to its default settings. Next option, CT. That just configures whether the unit is a master or a slave. One option with the B680 is we can run two of them together as a master slave. So for example, you have a particularly wide driveway. Let's say you've got a, a 12 meter driveway. You can put in two six meter barriers on either side, tip to tip, and you can configure them as master slaves so that they're both open and closed together and thereby control that larger entrance. The default for the unit is MA, which is master, uh, because most barriers are used singly in master mode, but it can be changed to a slave barrier, and we'll touch on that as well a little bit towards the end of the presentation. BU is your bus menu, so if you have any bus accessories fitted, uh, the default will be no. If you do have bus, uh, bus devices fitted, then you will be able to configure them through this menu. I won't go into too much detail on the bus devices now. Next option is your operating logic. Now, there's a number of operating logics that are offered with this product, um, automatic logic, semi-automatic parking, et cetera. How these logics function 
is uh, covered in the manual in quite a lot of detail, and uh, I will cover that very briefly towards the end of the presentation. But uh, there's just too much information to go through in a presentation like this. But basically, what the operating logic is, it determines how the barrier uh, responds to triggers, to opening triggers, closing triggers, safety triggers, etc. The defaults on the B680 will be E, which is semi-automatic. And semi-automatic logic is very simple. You you pulse the uh, the open input, or you touch it to ground, the barrier will raise. Uh, you touch it to ground again, the barrier will lower. So simple, open and close. Uh, if you want automatic closing on the barrier, you then have to change to an automatic logic, etc. Set a pause time for the for the lowering of the barrier, etc. PA is the pause time. So if you were running in automatic logic, it's how long the barrier remains in the raised position before it automatically lowers. Uh, that can be set up to four minutes, um, and the default there is twenty seconds. Again, any changes you make are made using the plus and the minus buttons at this point. Proceeding through the menus, you've got the SO, which is the opening speed, uh, can be set between zero, which is minimum, and 10, which is maximum. You will notice that the default is 10. And in fact, the default, regardless of your uh, beam length, is always 10. Because the barrier generally operates the smoothest in opening if it runs at maximum speed. So the default will always be 10 for opening. However, for closing, uh, the closing speed default is set to zero too. And that's because, again, for the longest beam, you want to be closing as slowly as possible. So that zero two uh, will change if you if you change your configuration to a shorter arm, or can be cut. You can come in and manually change that as well. But basically, you've got full independent control over the opening and the closing speeds. Uh, L one is your loop one. If you're going to be using uh, inductive loop one, which is the opening loop, you would have to enable it in this menu. The default is no, which means it's disabled. You would change that to yes if you wanted to use the uh, opening loop. Same for loop two, which is the safety closing loop. The default here is no. If you want to use it, you would set it to yes. If you are using the loops, you can set the sensitivity of loop one. The default is five, which is midway sensitivity, and the sensitivity of loop two again set to zero five. So you, if you are using the loops, you would maybe want to play with those, depending on what you want to detect and, and the size of your loops. You might have to play with those sensitivity values. Next option is MT, which is your motor movement, and this is really used as a just to check that your motor direction is correct uh, for the fact that it's a left or a right hand barrier. So when you get to the MT option, your display shows a dash dash. When you press the plus button, the, the boom gate will raise, and when you press the minus button, the boom gate will lower. It's a dead man. So when you press it, as long as you keep it pressed, it will continue to raise. When you let it go, it will stop, and similarly for, for minus for lowering. If the boom gate runs the wrong way, so if you press plus and it lowers instead of raises, then your motor need, your motor direction needs to be changed. And you just simply change that by swapping over two of the motor wires. It doesn't matter which two. I mentioned that there are three motor wires. In this diagram, it shows L1 and L3 being swapped, the black and the brown being swapped. Doesn't matter which ones you swap around. You just need to change any two motor wires. And you want to get to a point where Pressing plus raises the boom gate, pressing minus lowers the boom gate. Then you know your motor direction is set correctly. And then the last option is your time learning. And this is what actually sets up the uh, the limits, so to speak, uh, on, on the boom gate. Okay. You will come up with a dash dash. What you do is to start the setup procedure. Initially, your, your board would have been flashing 50. If you ever get to the board and it's flashing 50, all it's doing is it's telling you there are no limits set in this board you need to go through this uh, time learning process uh, the first thing is you go to your mt configuration in your configuration as i mentioned you check your opening and closing movement using plus or minus you then bring the arm to fully closed so you press and hold the minus button until the, the beam is fully closed you then go into your tl parameter which is the next parameter and when you're in tl with a dash dash you just simply press the plus and the minus buttons at the same time until the arm starts to open slowly and then let the button go and then what will happen is the arm will open slowly, it will close slowly, and the display should then change to ST, um, in which case you simply select ST. What ST means, it means store. Store the values that I've changed. Any values that you change will take place immediately that you change them, but they will not be stored in the control board until you acknowledge uh, a Y. In other words, at the end of ST, you acknowledge, you, you, you see the Y display and you press the F once more. That then stores the value. If you don't want to store the values, you're not sure what you've changed, you don't want to store them, use the plus or the minus to change the Y to a no, press the F, and then uh, you will not store the changes that you've made. But typically, the changes you made are going to be stored, so you make sure there's a Y, you press the F. And then the display changes to a system status. If the pole is closed, it'll read 0, 0. If the pole is open, 0, 1, etc. So 
the normal function of those two digits during normal operation is to show the status of the building gate. So just to show you, typically, um, if your boom gate is uh, lowered, you'll have a zero, zero on the display. If it's opening, typically zero, five means the boom gate is opening. Zero, one, if the boom, if the beam is open, or zero, four, if the beam is open, waiting to auto close, depending on your logic. Uh, it'll be a zero, one, or a zero, four. And then lastly, when the beam, when the beam starts to close, you'll see a zero, six on the display. So that just confirms then the status of your automation. All right, so having a look at our advanced configuration. So these are some of the more advanced settings. And uh, to get into advanced configuration, you press and hold the F button. And while you're holding the F button, you then press the plus button. And as soon as you do that, you go to advanced settings. And the first option you'll see is FO, which is the opening motor force. This is how hard the uh, motor actually pushes during opening. It can be set between 0 and 50. The default is set to 40. Uh, generally, you don't need to change that. Similarly, for FC, which is the closing motor force or the motor closing force, also, the default is 40. The only time you might want to play with these is if you really have a critical application where you don't want too much you know, closing force on the beam or you've got a very windy condition where the, the beam is struggling to move into the headwind, you might want to increase the force. But generally, those are left at the default values. And next option is your pre-flashing. So if you want to have a flashing lamp before the barrier moves, okay, and this is typically going to be the warning lamp that we spoke about earlier. You can set uh, whether you want uh, no pre-flashing, which is the default, uh, whether you want the, the lamp to flash before each movement, uh, before each closing movement, before each opening movement, or only at the end of the pause. The default is no, but you can set your pre-flashing function in the advanced configuration, as well as your pre-flashing time. How many seconds you want that pre-flash to, uh, to go on for between zero, which will be minimum, and 10, which is maximum, and that'll be in seconds. Um, your OC now setting is the sensitivity to obstacles during closing. So again, generally I would leave this at the default, which is 30, but this basically just says how sensitive is the system to detecting that beam hitting something while it's lowering. Um, again, as I say, leave it at the 30 and this is a very specific reason you want to change it. And you can make it less sensitive or you can make it more sensitive. Now we look at the next options are your outputs. We spoke about the various outputs on the board. Output one, um, this is the first of the open collector outputs we spoke about. Um, we now set what we want output one to do. And depending on what we choose, um, a one, a two, a three, a four, that determines when that output is active. So let's just say here, zero three would mean that that output one is active whenever the beam is closed or in the closed position. So that could be used to signal to an automa building automation system that the, the beam is closed. Or we could set it to 06, which will tell us when the beam is closing. So you can, you can basically choose what function you want that output to be active on. And there's a whole lot of options, as you can see, opening, closing, stationary, emergency mode, when the loops are engaged. So you can actually use that relay to extend your loop detector externally. Um, the default on output one will be zero four, so that means the boom is open or in pause. So in this particular case, if you don't change anything, output one is active when the beam is in state zero four. You can also change the uh, polarity of output one. So is it uh, is it normally open or is it normally closed? So the, the default is NO, which is a normally open output. Uh, and uh, if you change it to Y, it will be a normally closed uh, output. So that depends on you, you're saying, do you want that output to be active all the time and only inactive when the condition is met or vice versa? Now, similarly, we have output two, exactly the same as, uh, as, uh, as uh, output one. The default value is different, but uh, the functionality is the same, can also be set up the same. The same for output three, you can choose what function you want and whether it's uh, normally open or normally closed. And then when we come to output four, the difference between output four, as we mentioned, is output four is actually a relay output. So we have a dry contact, but again, its function can be set up using the advanced programming as well as its polarity, exactly as outputs one through three. We then have output five and output six. Now output five and output six are in fact the um, outputs that drive the beam lights. So those will automatically get set up, um, for example, to change your beam lights to red when the when the beam is down or lowering and green maybe when the beam is in the raised position. So again, you can set those up as you wish. And then lastly, we have um, output seven and output seven is the integrated flashing light. That's the optional light that fits in the top of the unit. And output seven basically determines how you want it functioning. You can choose zero one, which is traffic light mode. 
uh, or you could choose zero two, which is a flashing lamp mode. So in traffic light mode, the, uh, the, the lights at the top of the unit will be green when the unit's open and they'll be flashing red when the uh, barrier is moving. In flashing lamp mode, they'll basically flash red whenever the beam is moving and otherwise they'll be off in all cases. So output seven allows you to configure how you want that, um, that flashing light, that um, uh, optional traffic light to work. Um, we have an option called service request. Very few people use this, but what this does is, is it, it allows you to set up a warning light to come on after a certain number of barrier cycles. And the idea here is that it warns the end user that he should book a service. So you might say that after every 50,000 cycles, you want this warning light to come on, and that can be set up under the AS menu. So the default is off for the uh, service request. You can turn it on, and if you turn it on, you can specify how many thousands of operations and then how many hundreds of thousands of operations must be done before the uh, warning light comes on for the service. If you don't use that service indicator, you can always actually go in and look at these values for, um, uh, for thousands and uh, hundreds of thousands, and that will actually tell you how many thousands of cycles the barrier has done. So it's quite a useful indication of how hard your barrier is working if you're not using it as a, as a service indicator or service request. And then the very last option again is the ST, which is to store the values. Uh, you must select yes if you want to store your changes. And then once again, the, um, the display will change to your uh, barrier status. Okay, lastly, the expert configuration. I did mention there are three levels of programming on the E680. Expert configuration is the last one. Now, expert configuration is basically a, a very jumps very deep down into the operation of the board. So you really want to understand what you're doing before you make these changes. Because uh, expert configuration allows you to make changes basically to the different types of logic on the board. So as I highlight in video, before making changes at this level, be certain the steps you wish to change and the, and the effects on the automatic system are fully understood. So you need to know what you're doing when you go in here. And to get into expert configuration, you basically are going to uh, press and hold the F button, and while you're holding the F button, you're going to press the plus button for approximately 10 seconds. After 10 seconds, you will then move into um, your custom programming or your expert configuration, and you can follow that in the manual. I'm not going to cover it in this training because it's very seldom used, but just know that it is there for some very in-depth uh, customization of the controller. All right, so just give you a simplified startup. Um, you, you get in, you get to site, you've done your installation, you've got everything mechanically balanced on the boom, you've set your end stops. You want to just basically check that the operator is in the closed position, ready to open before you set it up. You want to note that your FSW stop and the EMR lights are all on, that normally those normally closed links are in. You want to make sure your open and closed LEDs are off. And if that's the case, then your inputs are all wired correctly. Make sure your bus status is green. Um, and you're pretty much then ready to run your setup. If you haven't made sure of all these previous conditions, then it's possible your setup might not run. So that's why we mentioned those first. So you'll do your setup procedure. You'll get into your MT mode uh, in your basic programming. You'll check the open and closing directions. You'll drive the uh, barrier all the way down to the lowered position, having changed the motor wires if that was required. Uh, then go to the TL parameter, press and hold the plus and minus buttons, and your boom gate will run through its automatic setup following which it'll end at zero, zero in the closed position and your boom gate is ready to operate. Okay, um, so if you do find that at the end of setup, your boom gate is open and the display is showing zero, zero, then you, it means you've configured it back to front. So you need to change over those motor wires and run through that process again. But always zero, zero is closed, your beam must be in the lowered position. If you want to run in master slave configuration, I'm just going to briefly touch on that. Um, as we mentioned, you can run two barriers in master slave. All that's required, obviously each barrier needs its own power supply, that's a given, but all that's required to interconnect between the two units is two wires. Um, you connect the bus to easy connector on the master barrier to the bus to easy connector on the slave barrier. Paying attention to the polarity. It's one of the few cases where you do need to observe polarity on the bus connection when you're using master slave. So terminal one on uh, the master go, a master bus connector goes to terminal one on the slave, and terminal two on the master bus connector goes to terminal two on the slave. Everything then is done from the master unit. So loops are connected to the master unit, triggers connected to the master unit, and the master will then ensure that the slave raises and lowers in synchronism with it. So quite useful when you've got, as I say, these very wide driveways where you want to put two boom nets and have them operating in synchronism. 
Uh, I said I would briefly touch on operating logic. So um, operating logic again defines how the barrier responds to various inputs in different um, operating conditions. There are a number of logics that all very well described in the manual in tables similar to what you see on the screen now. So I'll just quickly show you for the logic A, which is automatic logic. I'll just show you how to use this, uh, this particular table. So basically on the top, um, the, the top row for logic A, we, we show the uh, different inputs and on the left, we show the different states of the automation. So on the left hand side, for example, and I'm just using that as an example here, we say when the boom gate is closing, so I've highlighted when closing in red, and along the top, I say a, the FSW, which is the photo beam, the closing photo beam input is activated. So while the boom is closing, we activate the FSW input. What actually happens? Well, we just simply draw an error from each and we find that the barrier will immediate reverse, immediately reverse to opening. So in the A logic, if the beam is closing and you interrupt the, the safety beam, the boom gate will immediately reverse to opening. So that's how you use this table. It's basically telling you what each of the in, what effect each of the inputs has for a given state of the barrier. And that effect that the input has will change depending on the logic that you've chosen. So once you understand your site requirements and exactly how you need that this boom gate to operate, you will look through those logic tables and find a logic that suits what you're trying to do, and then choose the appropriate logic and lock it in for that particular site. All right, in terms of maintenance, uh, very little maintenance is required, but if you are going to do periodic maintenance, perhaps every six months, you want to check the balance uh, of the, the boom. So you'll put it into manual and make sure it sits at 45 degrees. Check correct operation of all your safety devices that your loops and your beams are, are detecting where they should and when they should. Uh, check all your electrical connections, look for hydraulic leaks, make sure there's no evidence of oil leaking from the unit. Tighten the screws on the boom pole coupler and the mounting plate to make sure that everything is, uh, is fits it firmly. And then just check your oil level. So again, every six months, maybe just check the oil level. Should be between the two notches um, on the uh, dipstick. And if required, fill up with the standard FWC HP fluid. So if you want to top it up, as I say, undo the nut, uh, lift the dipstick out, uh, and then fill up as required. Okay, air bleeding. From time to time, you might find that you do get air into the system. Perhaps during transit, the unit was shifted around a bit. Perhaps, um, you know, there's been a leak and some air has introduced itself in the system. Once you've corrected the leak, I'm just going to talk you through how you do bleed air out of the hydraulic system. So the products are typically bled of any air when you get them from the factory. So you shouldn't need to do this. But if you do find that the pole movement becomes irregular, so it's very jerky, uh, you might want to just make sure that there is no air in the system. So to bleed the system, you want to electrically operate the, the barrier. So basically trigger it up, trigger it down. When the it's fully open, okay, you'll slightly loosen and then tighten the bleeder screw on the piston um, that's shown now with the arrow. So in other words, the piston with the spring. So open the unit fully and then slightly release that uh, bleeder screw on the uh, piston with the spring and just open it until you see some fluid draining out. As soon as you see that fluid coming out, any air that's in there has not been cleared from the system. And then similarly for low, for the other piston, lower the, the barrier, so fully close it, then slightly loosen the bleed screw on the uh, piston without the spring till you see some fluid running out of it and then retighten it. And uh, that would have released any air. You might need to do this a couple of times, operate the barrier up and down, uh, bleed, and you just do that a few times until you, until you get a smooth operation of the piston. If you've done that and the piston's still not operating smoothly, there may be some other issue at play. In which case, you might want to just check your motor forces, your motor speeds, etc., to get that movement uh, correct. All right, so that brings us to the end of our presentation. Uh, we've got a, a opportunity now to ask any questions if you've uh, had them. I'm going to just quickly uh, unmute everybody. And um, right, so you are all now unmuted. So any questions that you do have now is an opportunity to ask them. So I am all ears. Okay, so no questions at all, which means one of two things, either everything was self-explanatory and I did a very good job or I did a very poor job and you've all maybe looked it off. Nonetheless, um, if you ever do have any questions, um, as you know, they will be uh, answered by us at any given time. You can just ring us up uh, anytime you like. Uh, ring our technical support uh, line and we'll be more than happy to help you. Uh, the manuals themselves obviously do cover a lot more of the content that I've covered or a lot more content than I've covered. They're always available and they are very good for your perusal. But in the meanwhile, I'd like to thank you for joining me today and um, uh, I look forward to uh, meeting with you at our next training session, which will be in one month's time. Thanks very much and have a good day. Thanks, thank you.